Hello, everyone. I'm going to start off by saying thank you so much for joining us tonight for our very first Hope Learning Youth Webinar. So we're going to be doing these webinars every couple of months with a new topics related to our Hope Spot and a new guest speaker that will be in our community. Um, my name is Sierra and I'm going to be your host and I wanted to say a big thank you to Blue Green Connections for sponsoring our event tonight. Um, they do beach cleanups and they have a Hope Spot Festival in February, which you should definitely go check out. And today we have the pleasure to be with the amazing Paige Condor from Tarpon Springs Aquarium and Paige's Planet. Hi, thank you so much for the introduction, Sierra. Yeah, we're gonna talk all kinds of things about animals and our hope spot, which is um, sort of the reason Blue Green Connections exist. But more on that in a minute. I do wanna show you a little video of basically what I do. So I'm gonna share my screen here and show you just a little bit. There we go, about uh, what I do on YouTube channels, kind of what Paige's Planet is. Here we go. Many reptiles are partially alive. humans, in fact, all of them. We are going to be talking about what I do um, and it showed some of my stuff at the aquarium as well as the out in nature component of it. Awesome. I'd, I also want to add before we get started that we definitely want to hear some of your questions you have for Paige and about our hope spots. So definitely put them below in our Q&A box and if you ask a question you'll be entered to win one of our prizes. We'll be giving away uh, two tickets to the Tarpon Springs Aquarium, as well as our Florida Gulf Coast Hope Spot Seagrass Meadows Guide and Coloring Book. And so, yeah, definitely ask a lot of questions for us tonight. Awesome. Yeah, great prizes. All right. So, I first want to start off by asking you, Paige, what exactly is a Hope Spot? And Great question. Yeah, go ahead. No, I interrupted you. What was the part oh, no. two of that? And, and what does that mean to you exactly? Oh, absolutely. So part one, what is a hope spot? Um, a hope spot is essentially an area of the ocean where a combination of scientists as well as local community members, both in business and in uh, like just individuals have kind of 
said, we need to protect this area. It can be an area that has essential animals and plants or habitat that support many different species. And the, the way that that gets nominated is through an organization called Mission Blue. So for example, our Florida Gulf Coast Hope Spot, we were nominated by Blue Green Connections to Mission Blue and basically it was accepted. So our little area of the Florida Gulf Coast gets protection from, well, gets a lot of community support and a lot of basically multiple facets working together to protect our essential habitat if that makes any sense mm -hmm. and then part two um what does it mean to me i think what a hope spot means to me is everywhere should be a hope spot right um we should treat the natural world with respect and we should admire the the many amazing things that are found in that area, the animal life, the plant life, because wherever you live in the world, even if it's not on the Florida Gulf Coast Hope Spot or not even near the ocean necessarily, it has its own unique, amazing features. And as neighbors in that world, in that part of the environment, we should cherish the things that are unique to it. Awesome. And then how are you a hope spot and how are you working to protect our waters? <laughs> well, I hope that in my work, I do a lot of educational work at the aquarium. I do the daily shows. Um, I talk a lot about animals. So I hope that I am one of many people like yourself that are out there sort of inspiring hope and spreading that word because when people are passionate about something they will react accordingly you know what i mean like just like you are inspired to protect the environment so you're going to do amazing things i'm just bragging on sierra because she came to tarpon springs aquarium and built us a composting banana circle which we have used to help make our business more environmentally friendly and you can be a pebble basically a little spark of hope that starts that ripple and if everyone that you inspire, even if some of the people that you inspire also inspire others, you have started this whole chain reaction that can lead to something really beautiful. So that's how I feel like I fit into it. What was part two of that question? I'm so sorry. Um, let's see. Oh, um, how also, um, how can everyone watching at home be a hope spot protector as well? basically what I said, um, you know, be inspired yourself, try to inspire others, and try to live your life in a way that is respectful to the environment. There's some basic things that we all can do, and I know we're going to talk about those with some of your, um, your further questions, but essentially, if you feel passionate about something, like the environment, you should spread that passion to others and live as a, a little beacon of hope. So you are a hope spot within the hope spot. <laughs> All right. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more about what are the animals and also ecosystems in our hope spot? Because I know you, you know a lot about that, working at the aquarium and educating. Yeah, I will definitely um, mention a, a few of those. So a couple of the ecosystems, and I'm going to start inland and work out. I did bring one surprise friend that we'll meet from one of these ecosystems in just a minute. But one of the ecosystems is kind of the swampland, right? Our uh, ponds, our... Um, uh, you know, you've all been swamp tromping. If you're a Florida kid, right, you go out and it's mucky. Well, that's a part of the watershed and all that water goes into the ocean. So keeping those areas clean and um, keeping that habitat in good condition is essential. And then as we move on out, so we've got the swamp, you've got the alligators and freshwater turtles and fish and birds, lizards, snakes. So many animals are dependent on that habitat in and of itself. And then as, you know, as when the swamp gets 
flooded, it's going to drain out into the ocean. We've got our waterways like freshwater springs that also lead directly to the ocean. Talk about an essential habitat. You've got manatees dependent on the springs, which who doesn't love a manatee, right? Um, you've got, again, tons of different species of freshwater fish and marine plants as well. And then we're gonna follow those rivers and waterways and run off out to the ocean, which we've got all kinds of cool habitats there. Mangroves, mangrove habitats, they're one of the best nurseries for the ocean and they protect the land. You know, we get nervous in Florida because big hurricanes come through. Mangroves, as well as some of our other features do help protect us from those huge storms. They have to protect against storm surge and take a brunt of the um, the initial impact of the storm if we let them, right? If we tear them all out and put a seawall in place instead, then we've sort of taken their purpose away. And then our seawall and our land area is going to take the brunt of that storm instead. So mangroves, you've got snails, you've got baby juvenile little game fish and all these tiny baby species, baby sharks, a whole miniature ecosystem in these shallow water areas protected from the predators in the deeper water. And they are basically, you know, they need those mangrove roots, they need that habitat. You've also got the barrier islands, which are great rookery, that'll be our science word for the day, but basically nesting areas for seabirds. Um, I know there's actually an island in the area called Three Rooker Island, and it's full of nesting seabirds. So you've got the barrier island. Um, we also have grassy flats. Who loves a sea turtle? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. I will admit, whenever you see a sea turtle, you get a little excited. Mm -hmm. So they are going to see the green sea turtles feed on the grassy flats. Manatees do as well because manatees are fresh and salt water. And so their essential habitats, um, they help clean the water as well. All that sea grass will help kind of almost filter our waterways. Um, let's see, did we get them all? Oyster beds. We've got a lot of oysters here. And if you go, you notice you go down further south as the water gets closer to the Caribbean and saltier, you don't have those oyster beds. So they're kind of a unique thing because our water is a little bit more brackish up this high in the Gulf of Mexico. And those oysters, I mean, look at all the little snails and little crabs, and little species that kind of have this whole mini ecosystem in those oyster beds. Okay, so that's all the coastal ones. And then I'm sorry, this question is, I'm going crazy with this one. And then we move out of the this kind of salty marshy areas and we go into uh, the deeper ocean. And then we've got sponges and rocky, hard, rocky bottoms with coral reefs growing. And that's where you're gonna find, I mean, we've got tons of bottlenose dolphins out here, hammerhead sharks that are endangered. Um, not just hammerhead sharks, by the way, lots of species of sharks. My personal favorite animal is the Goliath grouper. And they are found only in a few places in the world, one of which is the hard rocky bottom habitat that are right off the coast of Florida. So, we've got a ton of unique ecosystems in our hope spot. And I'm just mentioning the ones as we go out, you can go on a tangent, a whole thing about, we've got blue holes out there, which are basically uh, connections between our groundwater and the ocean, and they are hotbeds for marine life. So that is what we're protecting. And if all that's not worth protecting, oh my goodness. Do we wanna meet, do we wanna go ahead and meet the animal that I brought? Yes, yes. <laughs> Do it. Let me get into more of that. So in those habitats, the mangrove habitats in particular, as well as partly on even beaches and grassy flats for feeding, there are diamondback parakeets. <laughs> this one's name is Alice. I've got a bunch of them at the aquarium because some people get them as pets and can't take care of them anymore for whatever reason, and they end up with me, and that's Alex's story. 
He is actually an adult male. That's as big as the boys get. They're really very small, beautiful little turtles. They have polka dots on their skin and a little bit of yellow to their shell. They're small, but mighty. These guys used to be very common. Their numbers were high, but there's been a couple of things that have really set them back. Sea walls, I mentioned those already. If you can tell, I'm not the biggest fan. Um, the ladies that get a little bigger than the males, by the way, um, they need to get onto the beaches, onto land to lay their eggs, and sea walls will prevent them from doing that. So that's definitely a risk. And then um, on top of that, they will get trapped in crab trap. So they'll go into a crab trap. This is going to get a little sad warning. They'll go into a crab trap to eat the bait, and then they can't figure out, just like the crabs can't figure out how to get out, they can't figure out how to get out, but they breathe air. So they could end up drowning inside the crab trap. There are initiatives to make terrapin safe crab traps, which I um, really hope end up becoming permanent law for everything because it's such a shame. They're an endangered species in much of their range. And I'm gonna get him real close to the camera. He might be blurry. He's kicking, he's swimming away from me right now. <laughs> he's a little nervous not being with his friends at the aquarium, but he doesn't know he's being made into a star. But anyway, I think that they're so worth protecting and they used to be much more common than they are today. So they're definitely a species to keep watch over because we don't, I mean, it would be such a shame to lose this little unique species of turtle. Okay, buddy. <laughs> so that is some of the animals and some of the habitats. I don't know if we have questions about that or anything, but um, yeah, that's my tangent on it anyway. Right, let's see, we do have a question. It says, uh, which ecosystem is your favorite to explore? Oh, my favorite, probably coral reefs, because you never know what you're going to see when you're out um, in the coral reefs. Just story time real quick. You know, I'll take my camera and I'll be down snorkeling and uh, or scuba diving. But honestly, I prefer in that situation to be snorkeling because all the gear is slows me down. I want to go fast and I want to see everything and be up and down and all around. So I'll be looking underneath rock ledges and you could see, I mean, a big stone crab, sure. A fish, sure. Maybe a goliath grouper if you're really lucky, but also maybe a nurse shark stuck his head under that rocky ledge and you poke under and then you're looking eyeball to eyeball with a nurse shark who, by the way, is terrified of you. Um, just like it probably startles you a little bit. He's startled as well. Um, I know I've done that and I've seen a sea turtle sleeping underneath a rocky ledge before, a little guy or maybe even a big one if you're lucky. Um, stingrays, big southern stingrays. Uh, dolphins might come by. It's really, you just don't know what could be down there. So you are just along for the ride. And I like our kind of cloudy water. I know it's not quite Caribbean water, but it's full of nutrients full of life because of that. And um, I like having to get right down on the animals to see them, right? So if you only got five foot visibility, you got to get right there in the rocks to see what's going on. So yep, that's coral reefs for sure. Um, so I know you mentioned that Goliath groupers are your favorite animals. And I also wanted to give that question out to everyone in the audience. So type in the chat what your favorite animal is in our hope spot. Oh yeah, I'm curious to see your favorite local animal. I I love a lot of animals. Um, let's see, sea turtles are one of my favorites. And I do like horseshoe crabs because they've been around for so long. They're awesome. Yeah, I love horseshoe crabs. I mean, you say so long, they believe they've been around for 400 million years. And wouldn't it be, I mean, we have found all kinds of ways that horseshoe crabs help us. We are definitely indebted to horseshoe crabs. Thank you, horseshoe crabs, because 
our vaccines are only possible with a little bit of their blood. So they sacrifice for us. Um, so we definitely need to thank them. Oh, I saw someone's favorite is an octopus. <laughs> um, I was a little outside of our hope spot um, not too long ago this past summer and um, really it was spring and I was uh, exploring a coral reef in the Caribbean actually off the coast of Bonaire and we found an octopus that had taken all of these beautiful conch shells and decorated the outside of his home with these beautiful shells. That's actually how we ended up spotting him because we saw these pretty shells stacked up and then we went and looked and he's got his little eyeball sticking out of his hole. It was really cool. Yeah, we did get a question um, mm -hmm. that says, you said Goliath groupers. Wait, let's see. Uh, how big can a Goliath grouper get? Oh, great question. Yeah, so they believe there's some conjecture. They believe they can get up to about 800 pounds. The biggest one ever actually weighed was just over 600 pounds, but they think that, well, there, there's good evidence to support that they can get bigger than that. It's just when you've got an 800 pound fish, it's hard to bring him up out of the water to uh, accurately weigh him. Uh, they believe they live probably 60 to 100 years, but there's not a lot of studies that have been done on them. They're cool, big, smart fish. And I've gotten to work with them very closely at the uh, Tarpon Springs Aquarium and my work as a scuba diver. I've actually gotten to train Goliath groupers. So a couple of them I've built a relationship with, but one in particular in my career that um, knows hand signals and knows, um, you know, will come up and eat from your hand and give you a big fish kiss, which I'm not sure everyone would do, but I am a little crazy. <laughs> um, so yeah, they're very, they're very special fish to me because no one expects a fish to be that smart. And they are, and they have a lot of personality. So I think that they are underrepresented. So they're my forever favorite. Mm -hmm. Let's see what other questions we have. Let's see, um, what is your favorite fish? Although I think you kind of covered oh, that. Goliath grouper, but I'll pick another. I'll pick a second favorite mm -hmm. for that one. Um, I'm going to say, oh man, my second favorite fish, and I'm not including sharks because I have a favorite shark too. Um, I'm going to say my second favorite fish is probably a mangrove snapper. They're a local resident in the Hope Spot. They are beautiful looking fish. They have like a, a line when they're juveniles that goes through their eye. If you've ever seen one of those, you've seen a mangrove snapper. And they always live on the best reefs. So if you're looking to explore a good reef, sometimes it's hard to find a good spot. You're out in the boat and you just keep jumping in and it's grass, 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 which is great habitat, but you don't see a lot of fish on a grassy flat. So you know you found a good rocky spot when you see mangrove snappers swimming around. So I always like to see them. And then you follow them, they'll take you to the best part of the reef usually. <laughs> All right, I did want to talk a little bit about what are some of the dangers um, to the animals and the hope spots. Absolutely. Um, so what are some of the dangers? There's a lot going on. I mean, one umbrella term is pollution, right? Which comes in many forms, whether it's just litter bugs, leaving trash out at the beach or uh, runoff from our roads. Uh, a lot of people will put chemicals in their yard like pesticides or herbicides designed to kill the bugs in their yard as well as kill the weeds, but they don't stop working there, right? So you put them in your yard and they kill all the weeds and the bugs and then it rains and then they wash out of your yard and go somewhere else, which usually ultimately ends up being the ocean, and then they kill all the, you know, they might kill the um, 
the grasses, the sea grasses, they might kill the little animals, they might get in their system, and then we eat the fish and we're eating all these nasty things. Um, so that's herbicides and pesticides, but then there's also fertilizers to make your plants grow bigger. And then they get into the ocean and you think, well, good, they'll make stuff grow, but it doesn't really work that way because they'll make things grow too much. And then when those things that got too big die, they actually, as they decompose, they suck the breathable oxygen out of the water. And then there's no more oxygen for our fishy friends. And that can actually create ocean dead zones and um, fertilizers they believe are the things that are making red tide as bad as they are in our area. So that's a few of the threats. I can name a few others. I mentioned um, fishing. Now fishing, I don't think is something that you know, we can never fish ever kind of thing. I think that a lot of um, a lot of people enjoy fishing and there's commercial fishermen, their whole livelihood depends upon fishing. But I think that it needs to be done in a respectful, responsible way um, so that we uh, basically in a sustainable way so that we can work with scientists to monitor the fish levels and make sure we're not taking too many fish or taking the wrong, you know, you don't want to take all of the adult fish because then there's no more grown up fish to make more baby fish. So you want to make sure that we're monitoring the sizes and doing it in a way that um, is sustainable for the ocean, which will mean, you know, which means limiting ourselves on how much we take. We're really, really good at fishing. Uh, modern technology has allowed us to get much better than um, what the fish can naturally reproduce that if we just go hawk wild. So overfishing, pollution, uh, those are a couple of the big ones that our particular hope spot faces. Um, those are the two I kind of want to focus, I guess, you know, kind of focus on because they're the two that we can do something about uh, in our personal lives. And our next question kind of ties in with some of the dangers affecting our waters. And it says, what do you think is the most found trash? The most found trash, oh my goodness. I am not 100% sure about that. I'm sure with all the cleanup organizations, there is an actual like it's straws or water bottles. I am going to guess it is probably one of these three things. It's either going to be plastic water bottles, which there are a fair few. Um, there's going, it's gonna be, plastic bags of some sort, because there's always, I feel like every time I go out in the boat, you see plastic bags floating around. Um, and I know we find those a lot on our beaches. There's a lot of cans. Cans, plastics are the number one culprit because they almost, they basically never completely decompose. Cans are not quite as bad, but still pretty bad. They're still pretty lasting. Um, so definitely those things are things to keep in mind. And then, you know, you've got tons of things that are going to be kind of tied for second, third, fourth, and fifth place. Something that I see a lot that doesn't ever get mentioned is balloons. Um, like the helium balloons that you get at a birthday party. I uh, don't get those anymore for people or, you know, give them, that's just a personal choice because they float on the surface of the water after you know people let them go or you know oh no my balloon it does go somewhere when you let it go and it's usually the ocean and I know that you know sea turtles are looking for a jellyfish to eat that balloon with its string looks a lot like a jellyfish and so we would hate to affect the ocean in that way I know I've collected a lot of and popped brought back a lot of balloons from the boat so uh that is one to keep in mind that's maybe unexpected. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. We have another question that says, what's the number one endangered ocean animal? Oh my goodness. I don't know exactly what's most endangered, you know, like what is there less of, of any other animal or what exactly um, they mean by number one, because there's many endangered essential ocean species, everything from 
Uh, there's certain endangered species of crustacean all the way up to whales. So there's, there's plenty to choose from. I'm gonna say one that I know is in peril and that um, not a lot has been done to help them yet. And that's gonna be tuna fish. So tuna fish are critically endangered. They're these huge, when you get a can of tuna fish, I know when I was a kid, I thought tuna fish must be tiny because they come in a little can that's this big and you know, you can make a tuna salad or whatever. But, but um, they're actually these massive, big predators. They're like wolves of the sea and they move together in big schools and big packs. And one tuna will be hundreds of pounds and get a fisherman hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to catch one. And so the incentive is high, but there's, we're decimating them. There's not many left at all. They're critically endangered and there's not a lot um, to, there's not a lot of protection happening. Um, we're wiping them out really, and it's a shame. So uh, that's the one I wanna mention. Um, I know a lot of people really like ordering a tuna fish sandwich every once in a while. And it is, um, it can be, you know, eating a little seafood can be very healthy for you, but I would encourage viewers and um, to make your choice of what seafood you're eating make an educated choice so that you don't accidentally eat or you're not eating a lot of a critically endangered species. Have I eaten tuna fish in my life? Oh, I am guilty of it. Yes. But I try to um, be reasonable with that. And uh, now that I'm more aware of the issue, uh, I try to make a, a better choice, a choice that is more sustainable for the planet. All right, let's see. Um, our next question is, is there lots of overfishing in our hope spot? Yeah, good question. That's going to kind of depend on your opinion, right? Because you can look at data and see that certain species are maintaining, some are increasing, some are declining. And of course, there is, you know, it's scientists going out in boats getting this information. So um, there is also a question to how accurate the information is. In my personal opinion, I think that there probably is overfishing in our hope spot. To what extent is hard to say, because it's also really challenging to even monitor that you know you've got a big fishing boat they go out into the ocean there are regulations in place but unless there, you know there's not a law enforcement person enforcing it on the boat so it's hard sometimes to enforce that so i guess my answer is yes to exactly what extent i'm not personally educated enough to give you uh, a more defined answer maybe there may be more information that i don't personally have, but um, yeah, that's, a, I guess the best answer I can give. I know a lot of fishermen are good hearted and would, you know, are trying to follow the rules and they want the ocean to be successful just like everyone else, if not more so because their life depends on it. If the overfishing gets to a point that there's no more fish, guess who's really gonna suffer? Their family, right? Them, their family. So they, in most cases do understand that they need to work together with um, the governing bodies and with the scientists to make their business sustainable as well. So I don't wanna throw fishermen under the bus. I hope that's not how it's coming off. Um, there's just all these factors to keep in mind. That's a really, really mm -hmm. unanswered question there that you gave me. And I don't think I did very much to answer it at all. <laughs> But that's my uh, two cents on it, I suppose. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Um, this one might be a little harder, but what can we do to stop using plastics? Oh, that is a really hard one. Man, if you figure it out how to totally stop using plastic, let me know. We can do a lot to limit our plastic use, right? Especially single use plastic. We can um, get a like bamboo 
fork and spoon and uh, uh, metal straw that we have in a little pouch, keep it in your bag or backpack and then use that whenever you go out and about. Um, I used to be really, really good about that. I Right now, I'm, I'll be, I'm going to be 100% honest with all of you. I have um, not been carrying a bag as much. I've been worse about that, but um, it's definitely something that you can do. You can use reusable water bottles. I am 100% on reusable water bottles. I never, I mean, if I run to the store for five minutes, I've got my water bottle because not only is hydration important, it's so much better than using 10,000 plastic water bottles. It's such an easy thing we can do. Uh, reusable grocery bags. Now, there's a caveat on that, right? Because they showed that actually making one of the fabric reusable grocery bags is kind of bad for the environment and how much energy usage that it takes up. It's almost a wash with using a lifetime of plastic bags, which is very disappointing, right? But if you've already got them, don't go back to the plastic bags now. Use those reusable bags for sure. Um, so reusable grocery bags, the silverware, um, just, uh, you know, when you're putting away your leftovers, instead of putting something in a plastic baggie, grab a glass Tupperware is a better option. So those are a few of the easy things that we can do in our life. And um, if we really shop consciously, you can find products that are not in plastic bottles as much. You know, there are even shampoos and conditioners and laundry detergents many different products are now in glass or, um, you know, some kind of paper. So that helps them at the plastic usage as well. Yeah, plastic, miracle thing, but um, maybe not the best. There's a long-term uh, long thing for sure. Yeah, my, my family and I try to use as little plastic as we can, but it's kind of hard because if you really think about it, a lot of the daily things we use involve plastic. Right? Yeah, maybe... they do. No, I know it pretty much everywhere you go. If you buy something, it's cased in plastic, you know, a toy for Christmas that's got plastic wrapping. Um, so it's really, really hard to, you just have to be as conscious as you can. And hopefully, um, moving forward in the future, there are a lot of green, there are a lot of people working toward that goal. And maybe one of the people that you, Sierra, or myself, or one of the people watching this will be the beacon of hope that inspires the person that actually, there's a lot of people trying to invent plastics that are um, compostable. Maybe they'll be the one that figures out how to not only take one of those compostable plastics that works, but market it and distribute it in such a way that it can infiltrate the economy and be cost efficient for companies and get them using it. All right, let's see. Our next question is more about the animals in our hope spot. Uh, so a little happier discussion. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, what birds are in our hope spot? Oh, great question. We have a ton of birds in our hope spot. I mean, if you go bird watching in Florida, you will see all kinds. There's, I mean, tons of different birds that live on the land and birds of prey, bald eagles even, ospreys, which will, I don't know if you've ever seen an osprey like carrying a fish back to its nest. It's so cool. So we have birds of prey and then all of our ocean birds like heron, blue heron, um, egret, uh, my goodness, seagulls. I'm sure if you go to school and you have like an open eating area, especially in a high school, you have seagulls everywhere trying to steal the children's food. Uh, but they are, you know, they're native seabirds here. So gotta love our gulls. And then the best part about being in Florida is not only do we have all of our native birds that live here, but then the birds from up north, right, when they, you know, birds fly south for the winter, guess where south is? It's here. Mm -hmm. So we get all of their gulls and pelicans. Oh, I love pelicans. I think there's never 
maybe been a bird that looks as much like a dinosaur as a pelican to me. Uh, they're so cool. And so we get all of these birds from up north that kind of join our hope spot and rely on it. Even birds like bald eagles, endangered species will come down and they'll have a nest up north in some cases and a nest in Florida. And then they'll visit one for half the year and then they come down. Um, the male and female will usually stay at the nest up north and at the nest in the south um, just for certain times of the year. They are literally snowbirds, like what the people are. They do the same thing. <laughs> have a home in both places so that's a little a little tidbit on birds i'm not as um i i've spent more of my career with fish than with birds but um as i move forward in my career i do love birds i'd love to work with them more closely all right this next question is a little more about fish so maybe you'll enjoy this one um so someone had mentioned that their favorite animal is a shark and what are some shark species that live around us? We've got like a lot of them in our hope spot, tons of big ones. Um, they have found great whites in the Gulf of Mexico. It's not one of the more common species. Don't think you're going to see a great white every time you jump in the water or something. <laughs> but they've been found, they've been seen there before, a track coming up into the Gulf of Mexico, which would be part of our hope spot. And then they have bull sharks in our hope spot for sure. I've seen quite a few bull sharks personally. A few different species of hammerhead. There's the endangered scallop hammerhead that has been found, um, actually I believe right off Dunedin, Florida uh, is a nursery for scallop hammerheads. And then on top of that, there's a smaller species of hammerhead called a bonnet head. They're one of my, I'd say top five favorite species of shark because they're they're like the chihuahuas of the shark world. They only get like three to five feet long. They're cute. They are crab eaters. They're not dangerous at all to people. And they have that cute little hammer. So you get to, you know, experience the awe of a hammerhead in a tiny little cute package. Let's see what else. Oh, sandbar sharks. They migrate into our hope spot in the winter time because we have um, a fish called a mullet, which is about as plain a fish as you can imagine. They're, you know, about uh, maybe a foot and a half big. They have a plain silver body and a roundy head, but they spawn in the winter time and all these sandbar sharks and other species as well will come to this area as they spawn to try to eat the mullet when they're uh you know kind of off their guard so you'll see sandbar sharks did i skip any lemon sharks we have lemon sharks and lemon shark nurseries in our mangrove habitat so baby lemon sharks nurse sharks lots of nurse sharks, uh, less babies here. They actually will primarily, um, for this part of the world anyway, their nursery is further south, like in the Florida Keys, but the adults will live up in this area and are a common sight throughout the summertime when the water is nice and warm. So that's just a few of the sharks. There are, <laughs> there are more, but a lot of the big species do live in the Gulf of Mexico. So if you like sharks, you are, in the right place. Mm -hmm. All right, so this will be one of our last questions. And it says, what can people do if they see a sea animal in distress, such as a manatee or a sea turtle? Oh, wow, great question. So there are a couple things you can do. If it's something really simple i mean there are videos of if you're with grown-ups right there are videos of people helping out that animal themselves but that can be a little tricky and, and dangerous in some cases depending on what animal it is so within doubt i would give a call to the florida wildlife commission um they will get the word out and have a wildlife officer uh, they work with pretty much every facility uh, they can have a wildlife officer come and help you and that animal in distress so they um also have an app so if you want to on your phone i'm about to pull it up for you and show you my screen here on my phone i have it it's the florida wildlife commission app and it looks just like 
Oh, if you can see it, it's just going to be all blurry. But um, just like that, and you can find if you want to identify a fish, something like that. But you can also get a number to on your app to report an issue that you see with an animal. All right, let's see. Now it's time we can pick our winner for our Tarpon Springs Aquarium tickets. Yay. which is a really cool place. Even if you don't win, you should definitely go check them out. They have a lot of animals. It's a really fun time. All right, let's see. All right. Need a drum roll. <laughs> All right, yes. All right. Okay, the winner is, uh, let's see. They didn't put their name, so it was anonymous, but they had asked, what do you think is the most found trash? Oh, so, put your name in the chat if that's you. <laughs> yes, uh, please send a private message to the Blue Green Connections on the chat box uh, with an email on how you can receive your prize. Yeah, and then when you come to the aquarium, if I'm there that day, hopefully I will be, uh, make sure to stop me and tell me you were the prize winner because I'll, uh, I don't know, I'll do something special for you. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So I think it's about time to wrap up. But thank you, Paige, so much for coming here and talking with me today. And I hope everyone watching learned a little bit about our hope spot and the animals and ecosystems in there. Um, let's see. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. And thank you, everyone, for your amazing questions. Yes, thank you everyone for coming. I had a great time and definitely follow Blue Ring Connections on Facebook as we'll be posting when our next webinar will be. And also go check out what other events they'll be having. They'll be having a beach cleanup December 19th at Edgewater Park in Dunedin. And they will also be having a Hope Spot Festival in February, which is going to be a really great time. I'm really excited for that. Yeah, awesome. And if I didn't get to your question or whatever, um, you can reach out to me on the Pages Planet social medias and make sure to uh, support what I'm doing. Subscribe. Pages Planet Protectors is the YouTube channel that we pulled from. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you everyone so, so much. And yes, keep being Hope Spot protectors. Yeah. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you.